welcome in the last lecture i referred to the sensational discovery by young jocelyn bell in cambridge of pulsating neutron stars and the discovery of a rapidly spinning strongly magnetized pulsating neutron star at the very center of the crab nebula today we shall discuss how neutron stars emit electromagnetic radiation and why they pulse and how the mystery of the crab nebula can be now finally understood this is the distribution of pulsars in our galaxy to date roughly 2500 neutron stars are known in our own galaxy what is shown here are average pulse profiles of a number of pulsars the individual pulses of any given pulsar may vary slightly so what is done is stack up the pulses to find an average pulse profile for each and every pulsar this average pulse profile is like a fingerprint of the neutron star it's absolutely unique for each of the pulsars in this chart recorder tracing the pulses are seen as spikes in time periodically spaced of course but when you expand the time axis this is 100 milliseconds you find that there is a considerable amount of fine structure within the pulse it is this fine structure and the width of the fine structure in time delta t tells us that the size of the emitting region has to be less than c times delta t where c is the speed of light it is using such an argument that jocelyn bell came to the conclusion that these pulsating objects must be neutron stars pulsars sometimes switch off they null what is remarkable is sometimes they null for 8 hours 10 hours 12 hours and when the pulses reappear the neutron star seems to remember precisely the phase of the pulse so that the pulse when it reappears appears exactly where it should have appeared in time why this memory exists is still not fully understood but this phenomena of nulling is certainly uh, true of many pulsars it used to be thought that these were the signs of a pulsar which is just about to die but this is no longer the point of view that most astronomers believe in now let's recall some of the things i said in my lecture on accelerating charge radiation from accelerated charges an oscillating charge will radiate the energy radiated per unit time is given by larmer's formula 2 by 3 e squared a squared by c cube where a is the acceleration now this acceleration can be written, written in terms of x double dot where dot refers to time derivative and therefore the energy radiated per unit time can also be written as 2 by 3 c cube multiplied by the square of the second time derivative of the electric dipole moment now if the electric dipole moment oscillates periodically if d is d0 sin omega t or cos omega t then d by dt is proportional to the square of the dipole moment the amplitude of the dipole moment and fourth power of the frequency this is of course rayleigh's famous formula where well, in this i have used d is d cos omega t so if you take two time derivatives i get omega square and then if i take the square of that i get omega to the power 4 traditionally it's written as 1 over lambda to the power 4 and that is rayleigh's scattering formula just as a rotate charge going around in a circle will radiate similarly a rotating magnet will radiate a uniformly magnetized sphere has a magnetic moment 
which is equal to b times r cube where r is the radius and b is the magnetic field strength and therefore a rotating magnet will radiate and the energy radiated per unit time is given by 2 by 3 c cube the square of the magnetic moment tau the perpendicular component of the magnetic moment multiplied by the fourth power of the frequency which is b square r to the power 6 omega to the power 4 because the magnetic moment of a uniformly magnetized sphere is b times r cubed so if i take the square i get b squared r to the power 6. therefore the luminosity of a rotating magnet or the electromagnetic energy radiated per unit time is proportional to the square of the magnetic field and it's proportional to the fourth power of the frequency of rotation of the magnet. Neutron stars are incredibly luminous bodies. A rotating magnet will emit electromagnetic radiation as I just said just as a charge going around in a circle will radiate the energy radiated per unit time is proportional to b squared omega to the power 4. Where does this energy come from? This energy come, cannot come from the DC magnetic field. Therefore, the energy has to come from the stored rotational energy of the neutron star. And therefore, the neutron star will slow down in its rotation rate. So let's write down the formula for that. The energy radiated by the rotating magnet will have to come at the expense of the stored rotational energy. Therefore, the rotation will slow down and the period of rotation P will increase. The luminosity, and I put a minus sign to indicate that energy is being lost, is equal to 1 over 3 C cubed b squared r to the power 6 omega to the power 4. This is the formula that I had shown two slides earlier. This energy which is radiated by the neutron star must come at the expense of the stored rotational energy d by dt of half i omega squared which is the stored rotational energy of an object with a moment of inertia i rotating with an angular velocity omega. Now I can, if I differentiate this, I will get omega, omega dot. I can express omega in terms of frequency, sorry, period of rotation, 2 pi p is omega, uh, 1 over, excuse me, omega and p are inversely related. Therefore, I can write this formula in terms of the period derivative p dot instead of omega dot. And if I do that, I get a simple relation that the rate of increase in the period of rotation, p dot, is proportional to the square of the magnetic field and inversely proportional to the period. In other words, stronger the magnetic field, the more rapidly the neutron star will slow down because stronger the magnetic field, greater is the energy radiated per unit time. Shorter the period, greater will be the luminosity. Shorter the period means greater is omega. The luminosity is proportional to the fourth power of the frequency of rotation. Therefore, the rate of lengthening of the period, p dot, which is dp by dt, is proportional to b squared divided by p. And this can be easily measured for each pulsar. Now, because the period derivative is inversely proportional to the period, the slowing down rate, p dot, will decrease as the period lengthens. That's what I've indicated there. Therefore, in the beginning, when the pulsar is spinning very rapidly soon after its birth, it will lose energy at a tremendous rate and therefore it will slow down dramatically fast. Whereas, as its period lengthens, its slowdown rate will become slower and slower and slower, which is what I have indicated over there. The energy radiated by a rotating magnet will come at the expense of the stored rotational energy. And therefore, there will be a period derivative p dot. 
which can be measured. So what you can measure of a pulsar is its period of rotation P and the rate at which the period is lengthening, which is P dot. So clearly, if I multiply P by P dot, I will get B squared. This is how one infers the magnetic field of a pulsar. So the magnetic field expressed in Gauss is given by this very simple formula. The magnetic field is equal to 3.2 into 10 to the power 19 multiplied by the square root of PP dot. Now, if I plug in 33 milliseconds for the period of the Krab pulsar and its measured period derivative, which is a few times 10 to the power minus 14 seconds per second, then I get a magnetic field strength for the Krab pulsar of 4 times 10 to the power 12 Gauss. What is shown here is a plot of the period derivative versus the period of pulsars for about a thousand pulsars. This is y-axis is the is a logarith in logarithmic unit. What is plotted is p dot. The unit of p dot is seconds per second. And what is plotted on the x-axis logarithmically is the period in seconds. Now I can multiply p, p dot and take the square root and derive the magnetic field for each one of these thousand, couple of thousand pulsars and I can plot the logarithm of the magnetic field on the y-axis versus the logarithm of the period and you find an island of pulsars over there and you see that most of the pulsars have magnetic fields between 10 to the power 11 gauss to 10 to the power 13 gauss with a mean value of the field around few times 10 to the power 12 Gauss, such as for the Krab pulsar. You please notice that some pulsars have very strong magnetic fields as strong as 10 to the power 15 Gauss. Now one can also define a characteristic age of the pulsar. The characteristic age is defined as P divided by 2P, do, 2P dot. You notice period has the dimension of time. P dot is the dimension of time per time. Therefore, P over P dot is the dimension of time, which is the characteristic age of pulsars. For the Krab pulsar, the period is 33 milliseconds. The period derivative is 4 times 10 to the power minus 13 seconds per second. Therefore, the characteristic age of the pulsar is 1300 years, whereas the actual age of the Krab pulsar is 963 years, because we know the Krab pulsar was born in 1054 AD in the supernova explosion. Therefore, the characteristic age of the pulsar is the upper limit to the age of the pulsar. It assumes that the initial period of the pulsar was zero. In other words, initially the pulsar was spinning infinitely fast. But the pulsar is not sp born spinning infinitely fast. It has a certain period. Our estimate suggests that the Krab pulsar was born with an initial period of about 16 milliseconds. And that accounts for the small difference between the actual age of the Krab pulsar and its characteristic age as defined by this formula. Now what is plotted here is the logarithm of the magnetic field on the y-axis and the rotation period in logarithmic units on the x-axis. Most of the pulsars are to be find, found in an island over there with a period roughly about a second or so. Pulsars are born with strong magnetic fields spinning very rapidly. And then as they lose rotational energy, their periods will lengthen. The periods will lengthen initially very rapidly, then slower and then slower and slower, and therefore finally there will be a traffic jam over there and there will be a piling up of the pulsar, and that is how this island of pulsars has to be understood. So pulsars are released here, 
depending on the birth rate, we believe that pulsars are born in our galaxy roughly once every 25 or 30 years. So once every 10, 30, 25 or 30 years, a pulsar is released over here in this diagram. It races towards the right initially, then slows down, slows down, and then piles up over there. Now let us discuss briefly the electrodynamics of pulsars or the electrodynamics of a rotating magnetized sphere. This was first discussed by the great Michael Faraday. Indeed, the first dynamo that he constructed is the dynamo that I'm going to now discuss. Let us consider a metallic sphere. And we know from Thomson's theorem that the surface of a conducting sphere is equipotential. In other words, the electric potential everywhere on the surface of a metal sphere is the same. Now, let us assume that the sphere is endowed with a magnetic field B and that it is rotating about this axis with an angular velocity omega. Suddenly, charges will appear on this surface. Why? If the sphere is uniformly magnetized and rotating, Charges will appear on the surface with the surface charge density, which is given by sigma, which is the surface charge density, is B omega R divided by 4 pi C multiplied by cos squared theta. So the, 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 the symmetry of the surface charge density is quadrupolar. It is proportional to cos squared theta. In other words, it will have a maximum over there, or let us say it has a certain value over there, then it has a certain value over there, then it comes back to the polar value here, then it comes back to the equatorial value here, and then it comes back over there. That's because it is not cos theta, but it is cos squared theta. Please think about it a little bit. Now, why does this charge appear? Why suddenly, the moment I magnetize this sphere and I spin it, charges appear on the surface, because that is essential for the dynamo to function. All you have to do is, if there are charges, take a little torch bulb with two wires, connect one end of the wire to any point in the surface, another end of the wire to any other point of the surface, the bulb will light up. Essentially, that's what happens in your cycle dynamo. That is why uh, the light comes on, because there is a little magnet which is attached to a little rotating wheel which rubs against the rotating wheel of the cycle and therefore the magnet rotates and the charges develop. Why does this charge develop? Let's try to understand this. Let us consider an electron inside this metallic sphere. It will experience a Lorentz force. Why will it experience a Lorentz force? Because there is everywhere inside the sphere a magnetic field of strength B. And as the charges cross the magnetic field, there will be a Lorentz force, which is E over C, V cross B, where V is, of course, omega cross R, where omega is the angular velocity, and R is the distance of the charge from the center of the sphere. So this is Lorentz force, V cross B, or omega cross R cross B. So every electron inside this metallic sphere will experience this Lorentz force. But charges don't like to experience a force. It would like to do something to neutralize this force. And what the electrons do in this rotating magnetized metallic sphere is to rearrange themselves on the surface so as to create an electric field inside the metallic sphere. So and what will be the nature and the magnitude of the electric field? It will be that value so that the force experienced by the electron in that newly induced electric field will be equal and opposite to this Lorentz force. Therefore, the total force acting on the electron will be the sum of the Lorentz force due to the magnetic field and the sum of the force plus the electric the force experienced in the electric field, which is the charge of the electron multiplied by this electric field. 
that should be equal to this zero. Therefore, this electric field would have to be minus 1 over C omega cross R cross B. So that if I multiply this by the electric charge E over here, there will be an electric charge E over there. So you will see that this Lorentz force will be precisely cancelled by the force due to this induced electric field. And that it is for that reason that the sphere generates a surface charge density. The surface charge density, to remind you once again, is proportional to cos squared theta and it involves B and omega. Now, one can write this in terms of the surface electrostatic potential phi using standard formulae from your electrostatic books. I suggest you refer to Griffith's book, for example, or if you are a more advanced student, Jackson's Electrodynamics or Lando Lipschitz's Electrodynamics of Continuous Media. There you will find the expression for this electric potential will be proportional to P2 cos theta, where P2 is the second Legendre polynomial. In other words, this is 3 cos squared theta minus 1. This is quadrupolar in nature. Therefore, if I now have a uniformly magnetized sphere, and if I spin it with an angular frequency omega, there will be a potential difference between any two points on its surface. Therefore, if I connect the electric bulb here, it will light up. Let us look at how much voltage it will generate. If I consider a small magnet, a small sphere, whose radius is about 10 centimeters, and its magnetic field strength is about 10,000 Gauss, and I spin it with a period of 0.015 seconds, then I will generate about 5 volts, which is the sort of voltage you need to light up your cycle bulb. But if you are dealing with a magnet, which is as large as 10 kilometers in size, or 10 to the power 6 centimeters, and it's rotated with a period of one second, and it's magnetized to an astronomical field strength of 10 to the power 12 Gauss, then the voltage you generate between the pole and the equator will be in excess of 10 to the power 16 volts. Yes, you heard it right. 10 to the power 16 volts. It is because of this intense voltage that is generated that a pulsar works and emits electromagnetic radiation. We shall now see how it does that. So let's go back to the formula that I mentioned before. A rotating magnetized sphere is Faraday's unipolar dynamo. It generates a surface potential which is given by this formula over there. Don't worry about the details of the formula. I hope you are convinced that charge density will have to appear on the surface in order to uh, negate the Lorentz force experienced by the electron inside the metallic sphere. And you will generate a voltage which will be of the order of three, three, to the, three times 10 to the power 16 volts multiplied by B12 divided by P where B12 is the magnetic field in units of 10 to the power 12 Gauss. So if the magnetic field of the pulsar is 5 times 10 to the power 12 Gauss, then B12 is simply 5. P, of course, is period in seconds. So you will see that for a typical pulsar with a magnetic field strength of 10 to the power 12 Gauss, rotating with a period of a second or even faster, the voltage you generate will be 10 to the power 16 volts or even greater. So there is a strong electric field outside the star. The force on the charge due to this electric field outside the star will be far greater than any other force acting on the charge, which includes the nuclear force or the gravitational force. I want you to verify and convince yourself of this. So let me repeat what I said. If you have a voltage drop between the pole and the equator as strong as 3 times 10 to the power 16 volt or even larger, 
then the electrostatic force experienced by an electron or a proton which I put on the surface of this neutron star, that electrostatic force due to this electric field will be far greater than all the other forces experienced by the electron or the proton. For example, if it were a proton, we could compare it with the gravitational force. We could compare it with the nuclear force. All those forces are insignificant compared to this electrostatic force simply by virtue of the enormity of this electric field. So, to repeat, the electrostatic force on a charge at the surface is far greater than all other forces, including nuclear forces. Therefore, charges will be pulled out of the surface. We shall see in the next lecture, the surface of a neutron star has a crystalline lattice made up of iron 56 nuclei with electrons. These electrons will be pulled out. These particles from the nuclei will be pulled out. But you will say the particles inside the nucleus are strongly bound by the nuclear force. But the protons are now also subjected to this electrostatic force, which I hope you'll convince yourself is larger in magnitude than even the nuclear force. So protons and electrons will be pulled out and accelerated in this electric field. So since the magnetic field near the surface is very strong, the charges will be confined to move along the field lines rather than crossing them. In other words, as the charges are pulled out of the surface, it suddenly finds that there are magnetic field lines. The charges will be careful to slide along the field lines rather than move perpendicular to the field line because if it did so, it will experience a tremendous Lorentz force V cross B. Remember, V cross B is zero if V is parallel to B. Therefore, the accelerated charges the charges that are pulled out and accelerated by the electric field will slide along the magnetic field lines like beads on a string. That's what I try to indicate there. So an electron or a proton which is pulled out of the surface by the electrostatic force and accelerated by the electric field parallel to the magnetic field will slide along this field line rather than gyrate around the field line because it will cost that an enormous amount of energy because of the Lorentz force V cross B. Therefore, charges accelerated by the electric field parallel to the magnetic field will slide along the field lines like beads on a string. So let me repeat what I said. This is extremely important point for you to appreciate. The electric field outside the star need not be parallel to the magnetic field. I can decompose that electric field into a component parallel to the magnetic field and perpendicular to the magnetic field. The component of the electric field perpendicular to the magnetic field will accelerate the charge and make it move across the field line. The Lorentz force will prevent it from doing so. Therefore, what will win out is the component of the electric field parallel to the magnetic field, E parallel B. And that electric field will accelerate the charges and the magnetic field will make it go along it like beads on a string. This will give rise to a magnetosphere of the neutron star because the charges that are pulled out of the surface and which are sliding along the field lines are permanently trapped in the field lines. They can only go in the field line from the North Pole to the South Pole, bounce back, go to the North Pole again, come to the South Pole, go to the North Pole again, rather than move away from the field lines, because if we try to do that, it will experience B cross B force, which is enormous. Therefore, charges pulled out and accelerated are trapped to the magnetic field lines. The magnetic field lines are anchored to the star. Therefore, as the star rotates, the magnetic field lines also rotate with the star. 
Therefore, the charges which are trapped in these magnetic field lines will also rotate like planets around the star. So these charges can move along the field line from one pole to another, but it cannot cross the field line. That is simply because of this enormous magnetic field strength. Since the field lines are anchored to the surface, they will co-rotate with the star. The field lines will co-rotate with the star. They are like wires from in a metallic sphere. So as I rotate the sphere, these wires will also rotate. The wires are of magnetic field lines. So the charges trapped in the field will also co-rotate and this gives rise to the magnetosphere of the neutron star. So there is a sphere of charges around the neutron star. And these charges are going round and round because they are tied to the magnetic field lines. Where did, this, where did these charges come from? They were pulled out of the surface and accelerated to a relativistic speed by the component of the electric field parallel to the magnetic field. What is shown here schematically is this magnetosphere around a neutron star. This is the magnetic axis of the neutron star. This is the rotation axis. Now you may say, why isn't the magnetic axis aligned to the rotation axis? It doesn't have to be aligned to the rotation axis. You take the Earth, for example. The rotation axis of the Earth is distinct from the magnetic axis of the Earth. In fact, the magnetic axis of the Earth keeps on changing its direction and every now and then it even flips. What is North Pole suddenly becomes South Pole. So the magnetic axis does not have to be parallel to the rotation axis. So what is shown in green are these charges that are filled, uh, filling this, which are trapped to the field lines. And that defines the magneto rotating magnetosphere of the neutron star. Do we know of such magnetospheres around other rotating bodies? Certainly yes. The Earth has a very strong magnetosphere. Here is the Earth, here is the uh, Earth's magnetic field, dipolar magnetic field. And here is the solar wind, wind of charges, electrons and protons coming from the sun. And these charges are trapped by these magnetic field lines. Therefore, there is a magnetosphere around the Earth. And these charges can move along the field lines from North Pole to South Pole, North Pole to South Pole, North Pole to South Pole. And as they do that, they trigger such spectacular Aurora Borealis. I don't know how many of you have seen Aurora Borealis, but if you, had, if you have seen it, you will appreciate it's one of the most awesome sights you can imagine. And this emission is really due to the charged particles interacting with the Earth's atmosphere near the magnetic North Pole and the magnetic South Pole. Now I must introduce a very important notion of a light cylinder. A co-rotating magnetosphere charges trapped to the field lines and co-rotating with the star with the same angular frequency omega cannot be larger than a critical size because there will be a distance. Remember omega cross r is v, the tangential or the circular velocity. Therefore, when r reaches a critical value, omega cross r will become equal to the speed of light. So the charges at that distance are really going around. The circular velocity corresponding to the angular velocity omega will be equal to the speed of light. Therefore, you cannot imagine a magnetosphere extending beyond that distance because if you did insist on that, then you will have to conclude that those charges will be moving faster than the speed of light, which of course it cannot do so. That's another way of saying the magnetosphere, the co-rotating magnetosphere cannot be larger than a critical size at which the co-rotating circular velocity will be equal to the speed of light. And that is often called the speed of light radius or the light cylinder radius. 
and that is given by this very simple formula v is r omega and it is the distance at which v becomes equal to c so the distance from the star at which v becomes equal to c is given by c divided by omega for omega is the angular frequency of rotation and c is the speed of light and r is the distance from the rotation axis of the neutron star pictorially i have shown it over here so here is an inclined magnetic rotator this is the magnetic axis and this is the vertical axis is the rotation axis there is a critical distance r from the center of the neutron star so i have a cylinder with a radius r light cylinder which is equal to c omega over omega so all i am saying is all the charges which are trapped to the field lines inside the cylinder are allowed to co-rotate with the star and they have to co-rotate with the star because they are tied to the field lines and the field lines are anchored to the surface of the star but outside field lines that close outside the cylinder charges cannot be trapped to them because if they were trapped to them then they would be moving at a speed greater than the speed of light therefore something dramatic will happen on uh, the charges which are on these open field lines all field lines have to close go to infinity and come back to the star when i say closed field lines or open field lines i am making the following distinction i will call as closed field lines as those field lines which close inside this light cylinder which i have shown with the red cylinder over here so these are the closed field lines these are the open field lines that is they go out of the cylinder and come back into the cylinder so therefore they can be co-rotating magnetosphere only around these closed field lines and what about the charges that are pulled out of the surface which happen to be on field lines that cross the light cylinder they will simply flow out of the light cylinder therefore what will happen is charges can co-rotate with the star only inside this light cylinder co-rotation circular velocity will be equal to the velocity of light at the light cylinder therefore charges trapped in field lines that close inside the cylinder can co-rotate with the star but charges accelerating along the open field lines will simply escape from the star so this is the punch line of our story the electrostatic force pulled out charges and accelerated accelerated them along the field lines these charges are tied to the field lines they can only slide along the field lines as long as they are trapped to the field lines that close inside the light cylinder they will simply be trapped and they will form the magnetosphere of the neutron star but charges which are pulled out along field lines which do not close inside the light cylinder have no option but to simply flow out to infinity along these open field lines so charges that are pulled out along these field lines will simply flow out both electrons and protons that are pulled out and accelerated will flow along this open field, open field lines cross the light cylinder and then flow out to infinity so let me repeat what i said charges moving along the field lines that cross the light cylinder these field lines will escape from the star these are the charges that will fill the crab nebula these are the charges that trotsky wanted the central engine to supply 10 to the power 38 x per second worth of relativistic electrons in order to explain the x ray and optical and gamma ray luminosity of the crab pulsar so this is how the central engine which was postulated by franco piccini supplies these relativistic charges the radiation from the nebula the crab nebula which is very 
outside is the radiation emitted by these particles as they gyrate in the magnetic field of the Crab Nebula. This is what Klopsky had claimed in 1960. Now we understand in detail how this happens. We understand the electrodynamics of these charges. Now these charges which are sliding along the field line at relativistic speeds will radiate because they are being accelerated. Even if their speed is not increasing, because the field lines are curved, they will experience an acceleration, the change of direction of their velocity vectors, and therefore they will radiate. And because these charges are ultra-relativistic, with a gamma of a million or a billion, where gamma is 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared by c squared, the radiation will be beamed in the forward direction into a small angle cone whose opening angle is 1 over gamma, where gamma is the Lorentz factor 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared by c squared. So the radiation from the relativistic charge will be beamed in the forward direction. The cone of radiation will be narrower, faster the particle, and the radiation will be linearly polarized, and the plane of polarization will be the plane of the orbit. Remember our discussion. In the case of non-relativistic particles, the particle will radiate in all directions. Therefore, the radiation could be either plane polarized, if you look in the plane of the orbit, or circularly polarized, or elliptically polarized, if you look in arbitrary direction. But in the case of a relativistic charge, because the radiation is beamed in the forward direction into an incredibly narrow cone, the radiation is confined to the plane of the orbit. And the polarization is linear 100%, and the plane of polarization is the plane of the orbit. So, these charges, which are flowing out along the open field line, Yes, it is true, they will end up in the Crab Nebula and radiate there. But as they are leaving the neutron star, they will radiate. And that is the radiation that we are now going to discuss. Not the radiation from the Crab Nebula. That story is over for us. We want to now discuss the radiation emitted by the neutron star itself. Now, I am saying that these charges which are flowing out along the open field lines, will radiate. Is this the radiation that Jocelyn Bell detected? No, that's not the radiation Jocelyn Bell detected. Because this radiation will be mainly ultra-high energy gamma rays. Because the radiation is from ultra-relativistic particles, and the characteristic frequency will be gamma cubed times the gyration frequency, and that will be in some ultra-high energy gamma rays. So that's not the radio radiation that Jocelyn Bell detected. Now, fundamental progress was made in understanding the radio emission from neutron stars, the radio emission that Jocelyn Bell detected, or in a classic paper by V. Radhakrishnan and his collaborator Cook, working in Australia, Sydney, Australia, in 1969. What they discovered was something very simple and extremely beautiful. Here are the pulses from a pulsar. They were discussing the pulsar in the supernova remnant Vela. At every, this is the duration of the pulse. It, the pulse lasts, the pulse period may be once every second or whatever it is. But within the pulse, the pulse has a certain duration, delta t, 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds. Within that 100 or 200 milliseconds, they measured the plane of polarization of the radio radiation at every instant of time within the pulse. They found that the radiation was 100% linearly polarized at every instant of time. 
but they found that the direction of radiation was changing like the Japanese fan that you open out like this. That's what I have shown there. The plane of polarization at different instants of time all within a single pulse. And this will be the same in the next pulse and the next pulse and so on. Therefore, there is a sweep of the plane of polarization within the pulse. But I just said in the previous slide that the radiation will be plane polarized in the plane of the orbit. So if the plane of polarization is rotating, that simply means that you are looking at radiation from different orbits within the pulse. And they formulated the famous polar cap model of pulsars. 50 years later, that is still the only working model we have for why pulsars pulse. This is known as the polar cap radiation. Radio radiation is produced, they concluded, just from this simple observation. From this simple observation, they deduced several spectacularly important consequences, inferences rather. They deduced that the radio radiation is produced right near the surface of the magnetic pole by relativistic electrons sliding along the curved field line. How did they knew how did they know that they were relativistic electrons? Because the radiation was exclusively linearly polarized. And how did they conclude that it is right near the polar polar cap? That is because if I look at the magnetic field lines emanating from the surface of a dipole magnet, and if I look at it in projection, it will be like if you open an umbrella, and if you look, if somebody else is looking at the umbrella, they will see the curved spokes of the umbrella. Right near the axis of the umbrella, the projection of those spokes will be lines radiating like this, exactly like the plane of polarization. They also deduce that the radiation will be in a hollow cone that it is highly linearly polarized. All these detections were from a simple observation of the sweep of polarization vector within the pulse. So their point was that, that what you are really seeing is the projection of the magnetic field lines. These field lines are actually curved. They are coming, they're coming out of the screen and going in different directions, like the spokes of an umbrella. But when seen in projection, this is what you will see. Therefore, if your line of sight is cutting like this, then at each instant of time, it will be linearly polarized parallel to that field line, parallel to that field line, parallel to that field line, and you will get this geometry or the plane of polarization within this pulse. The radiation must be from relativistic electrons since it is linearly polarized. The sweep of the polarization mirrors the projection of the dipole field lines close to the magnetic pole. Therefore, electron must be moving along the curved field lines because the magnetic field lines after they emanate from the surface or curve. So let's try to understand this carefully now. The radiation from relativistic charge will be beamed in the forward direction, yes. But it will not be radio radiation because the radio radiation, sorry, so, so this is something that I already explained, therefore let us skip this slide. So this is what they concluded. The radio radiation must emanate from the polar cap and there will be a narrow cone of radiation and it will be a hollow cone. And because the magnetic axis is not aligned to the rotation axis, it will be like the searchlight mirror. You will see it once every rotation provided your line of sight is intersects the opening angle of the cone. So if you are looking from here, you would see the radiation once every rotation, 
But if you are looking from some other direction, from some other part of the galaxy, you will not see this radiation because the cone of radiation is missing you. Why will it be a hollow cone? So the particles are pulled out of the surface and they are accelerated along the field lines. Near the very magnetic axis of the uh, star, the magnetic field lines will have very little curvature as shown in the figure over there. Charges sliding along straight field lines will not experience any acceleration. And you must have acceleration for radiation, therefore they will not radiate. Only particles that will radiate are particles which are moving along curved field lines. This is why they said the radiation must be a hollow cone. And the radiation is indeed a hollow cone, uh, proving their conjecture. There will be no radiation from electrons sliding along straight field lines, curvature are important for acceleration and therefore radiation. Electrons accelerated near the surface have such enormous energy that they produce gamma rays and not radio waves. We are interested in radio radiation. So how does it produce radio radiation when initially this charge is producing only gamma rays? ultra high energy gamma rays because the characteristic frequency will be gamma cube times the gyration frequency and because gamma is a million or a billion gamma cube will give me gamma rays and not radio waves now this is how you can get radio waves from gamma rays so listen to this very carefully here is a photon which tries to decay to an electron-positron pair. Now I'm sure you know that this process is not allowed. And I hope you know the reason why this is not allowed. So let me tell you the reason and you please work this out for yourself. This photon cannot spontaneously decay to an electron-positron pair because it cannot simultaneously satisfy energy conservation and momentum conservation. There will be no difficulty for a gamma ray of high enough energy to create an electron or a positron out of thin air. But it must also satisfy momentum conservation that it cannot do. And therefore this process is forbidden. But you can have the following situation. And a photon and another photon come in the vicinity of an atomic nucleus and that can produce an electron-positron pair because energy and momentum conservation can now be satisfied by borrowing and giving momentum from some other source. Similarly, so that's what I've indicated, a particle-antiparticle pair cannot annihilate and produce a single photon it can produce only two photons. Similarly, I need two photons to produce an electron-positron pair. Okay? I can have a photon interacting with the nucleus and produce electron-positron pair. As I said, energy momentum conservation can both be satisfied now because the nucleus acts as a sink or a source of momentum that is needed to satisfy both energy and momentum conservation. So this process can and does occur all the time. Similarly, a photon can also create a pair in the presence of a strong magnetic field. A magnetic field has a tension. A magnetic field in a conducting medium has a tension. If I pull the magnetic field and let go, it will oscillate like the strings of a guitar. And those oscillations produce waves, which are called Alfred waves. And they are very important in objects like the sun. Therefore, because magnetic fields have tension, they can absorb and give momentum to the photon. Therefore, a photon in the presence of a strong enough magnetic field can produce an electron-positron pair. So our story is now getting interesting. We are near the surface of a neutron star. 
which is very strongly magnetized. Charges have been pulled out of the surface and accelerated to ultra-relativistic speed by the electric field. These charges produce gamma rays. Now let us look at one gamma ray. That gamma ray interacts with the magnetic field. Look at the tip of the arrow of the cursor, if you can see it against the white background. That gamma ray produces an electron-positron pair. Electron moves towards the surface, the positron moves in the opposite direction. Both are accelerated, so both will emit radiation. And that radiation hits another field line and produces an electron-positron pair. Both are accelerated in opposite direction. Both will radiate. And those photons can now interact with the magnetic field and produce more electron-positron pair. Therefore, very quickly, within a very short distance of a few meters, starting with one single gamma ray photon, you can end up with 10 to the power 46 electrons and positrons. And these electrons and positrons will now be moving with modest velocities, not with this ultra-relativistic speed of the original electron that was pulled out of the surface and accelerated. So that energy, via the gamma ray that it emitted, has gone into producing 10 to the power 46 or 10 to the power 47 electron-positron pairs. And they produce the radio radiation that you observe. So we can skip this slide. So the radio radiation that we observe is not from the original particles that are pulled out and accelerated and escaping to infinity along the open field lines, but out there in the outer regions of the magnetosphere, there is a cascade of electron-positron pair production by the gamma ray in the magnetic field. So, the gamma ray, let me repeat, the gamma ray is produced near the surface by curvature radiation. Curvature radiation is the radiation by charge accelerating along a curved field line. It produces a cascade of electron-positron pair. Particles of one charge will flow towards the surface. Particles of the opposite charge will flow along the open field lines to infinity. It is these charges that produce the observed radio radiation. One of the things that Jocelyn Bell discovered was that the radio radiation from pulsars, all pulsars, is coherent radio radiation. It is like radiation from a laser or a maser. How do you know that? Because all a radio astronomer does, and they do this the first thing, the moment they detect the source, they calculate what is the brightness temperature of the source. So if you remember the second lecture, the brightness temperature, what you measure is a certain specific intensity at a certain specific frequency. That is all you measure. You measure I nu at nu. Then you ask, what would be the temperature of a hypothetical black body that would radiate that same amount of I nu at that frequency nu? You are not saying the object, you don't know anything about that object. You don't know anything about the nature of the radiation or the mechanism of radiation. So you are not saying it's a black body. You are simply saying what the temperature of that body ought to be if the radiation that you observe, where to be black body radiation at that frequency new, giving rise to that amount of specific intensity. That is the brightness temperature. So the brightness temperature of a radio pulsar turns out to be astronomically large, 10 to the power 25 or 10 to the power 30 Kelvin. Surely you cannot have a neutron star at a temperature of 10 to the power 30 Kelvin. It'll just break up into neutrons. There will be no star. This, this implies the radiation has to be coherent. So please go and refer once again to the second lecture. Let me briefly tell you what, why this is so. So people have conjectured what comes out 
or not individual electrons and positrons, but bunches of electrons and positrons, bunches consisting of 10 to the power 14 or 10 to the power 15 particles, they radiate in unison, they radiate in phase, and they produce coherent radio radiation. Now, let's go back to what I discussed in the second lecture. There is a specific intensity I nu zero that is incident and what comes out is I nu that consists of two terms. The first term I nu zero e to the minus tau nu is just the background radiation that is attenuated that does not even exist in the present case. What comes through that radiation is the radiation that it would radiate had it been a black body I nu b multiplied by 1 minus e to the power minus tau nu where tau nu is the optical depth. It can be, the exponential can be expanded as 1 minus tau nu plus tau nu squared, tau nu cube and so on. And if the optical depth is rather small, then I need to keep only the first two terms of the expansion. 1 and 1 cancels out. So I will get from this body the amount of radiation I will get will be the amount of radiation I would get if it were a true black body multiplied by the optical depth tau nu, which is much less than 1. So I get only a fraction. So we concluded that if I have an optically thin body, then the intensity of radiation I would get at any frequency will always have to be less than the intensity of radiation that I would get had the body been truly opaque and therefore black body. We said at no frequency can that body emit radiation intensity which exceeds that of a black body. This is known as the brightness temperature limit. But that was true only if the radiation is incoherent radiation. And the body is in thermodynamic equilibrium with radiation. I stress that a laser and a maser is not in thermodynamic equilibrium. And that is why the radiation is not incoherent, but the radiation is coherent radiation. So please appreciate that the radio radiation from pulsars is coherent radiation, like the radiation from a laser or a maser. Why this is so? is still not fully understood. So now let's go back to near the light cylinder. The light cylinder is at a certain distance from the center of the star. It is at a distance where the co-rotation velocity will be equal to the velocity of light. By that time, by that distance rather, the strength of the magnetic field would have decreased because the dipole magnetic field decreases in strength as 1 over r cubed. Please consult Griffith's book or Purcell's book on electricity and magnetism. A dipole magnetic field strength decreases as 1 over r cubed, where r is the distance from the magnetic dipole. Therefore, if you go several stellar radii away from the star, the magnetic field strength from 10 to the power 12 Gauss will come down to just a few Gauss. Now the electrons need not move strictly along the field lines. Because the magnetic field has now become significantly smaller than near the surface, V cross B force will be much smaller. The V cross B Lorentz force which prevented the electrons from moving across the field line is now much weaker and therefore the electron can gyrate around the magnetic field near the light cylinder and produce synchrotron radiation. This synchrotron radiation can now be in the visible wavelength, it can be in X-rays or it can be in gamma rays. So that is how we believe that the optical X-ray and gamma ray pulsed radiation from the crab pulsar is produced. The radio radiation is produced right near the surface by curvature radiation, not synchrotron radiation, by curvature radiation, particles sliding along curved field line. 
But right near the light cylinder, the charges can defy the magnetic field and gyrate around it, producing synchrotron radiation. And the characteristic frequency will be gamma cube times the gyration frequency. Therefore, depending upon the energy of the particle or the gamma of the particle, it will produce either visible radiation, X-ray radiation, or gamma ray radiation. All that radiation will still be beamed sufficiently that I will see pulses of radiation. So that is how pulsed optical, pulsed X-rays and pulsed gamma rays are produced by the crab pulsar and a few other pulsars. So to repeat, near the star, the field strength is strong and the charges can only slide along the field line. They emit curvature radiation. They emit gamma rays. And these gamma rays produce electron-positron pairs, which then produce the radio radiation. Since the field lines are curving, they will radiate in a narrow cone whose axis is tangent to the field line. This is how the radio radiation from pulsars is produced from fairly close to the surface of the neutron star. Near the light cylinder, the field is weaker, much weaker, and the charges can gyrate and produce synchrotron radiation. This is how the optical X-ray and gamma rays from pulsars are produced. And then, way beyond the light cylinder, a parsec, a light, light year or so distance away, we started with a distance of 10 kilometer radius. Now we are talking about a light year distance, which is the size of the Crab Nebula. These electrons and positrons will gyrate in the nebular magnetic field, producing X-rays, gamma rays, visible radiation, and radio waves. That is the radiation we see from the Crab Nebula. So the radiation that we see from the Crab Nebula, the diffuse, amorphous, featureless radiation at the center, which is strongly linearly polarized, is produced by the electrons and positrons that were created right inside the light cylinder of the neutron star. And what you see in this picture is this neutron star at the center of the Crab Nebula and the, the relativistic particles and the magnetic field leaving the neutron star and energizing the Crab Nebula. So that is how a strongly magnetized, rapidly rotating neutron star produces electromagnetic radiation the radiation is pulsed in a narrow cone because the radiation is produced by relativistic particles. And the magnetic axis is inclined to the rotation axis. Therefore, you see this narrow cone of radiation only once every rotation, like you see the beam of light from a lighthouse only once every rotation of the searchlight on the top. In the next lecture, we shall take a journey from the surface of a neutron star right to the center of a neutron star. And we shall try to anticipate what the internal structure ought to be. And we will do all this from absolutely first principles. And you will find this story extremely exciting. So till then, thank you very much for your attention.